Shondells, eights on pylons, steep spirals, keys to your commercial check ride, and understanding what's going to be tested so you could be successful in your practical exam. I'd like to welcome examiner Bob Work, and uh, please give him a warm welcome, please. Thank you. Hello, today we're moving forward. We'd already accomplished private and instrument uh, review of common errors, uh, areas of operation that lead to notices of disapproval uh, from the other examiners and myself, some who have been uh, examiners for 40 years, 25 years, and have accomplished 20,000 events. So the items that we're going to talk to today for commercial are going to be related to an initial commercial single engine check ride. We're not going to go through the prereqs or the pre flight or qualification of the airplane because we already accomplished that on the private in an earlier session. But it would be relatively the same except for the overall description of the flight events that are going to take place. So, if you got a copy, we're going to have some up here also on the overhead. We're picking just certain areas um, that we're going to discuss, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, at the end, we're going to go back and revisit the private instrument commercial and just hand out some bullets for the common areas of operation that just seem to appear over and over again. What's the goal? The goal is to uh, set up your students for successful outcome of their commercial practical test. And we've also already reviewed endorsements and logbook certification. So we're going to assume all that's taken care of and move right into the ACS. And obviously, Back on the cross-country flight planning, so we're going to go to six. The uh, commercial pilot is now given the same exercise, really, as private, but probably has a couple hundred hours by now or more, depending on what school, and has been pretty focused on instrument flying. Um, so what, what are we going to talk about? cross-country flight planning, nav logs, and it's just revisiting those same events, but in a more detailed uh, environment. And obviously, we're going to bring in the page six. So let's go to cross-country flight planning, no, uh, page six, and look at the similarities from the elements of a VFR flight plan down there on key, Kilo 4. By this point, the flight instructor um, <clears throat> is just reviewing and quizzing in scenario-based ground instruction what did private, uh, private pilot with an instrument rating, what did he or she forget? And we're, it, should, it should be an event where they take you through your cross country and they know how to do all this, right? And it's going to start with fuel requirements, estimate time of arrival, developing the nav log, and presenting it to the examiner because we're down there in the skills section. Let's, let's go down there. And we got, obviously, prepare, present, explain cross-country flight plan assigned by the evaluator, including risk analysis based on real-time weather, first fuel stop, create nav, uh, Sierra 3, create a nav plan and simulate flying the VFR flight plan. Re recalculating fuel reserves, okay, um, because we want to be able to tell the examiner, or in this case the flight instructor, and you guys can go through this when you're flying cross country with your students, hey, the estimated time of arrival is in Zulu, and make sure they understand that. And so to, he to hear a commercial applicant not know how to change local time to Zulu time is a little bit alarming at that phase and actually look at a pre-printed flight plan and and just going back to reevaluate the knowledge of the elements involved with the 
with the VFR flight plan and how to activate and close it, right? And then we pull the chart out. And of course, we're looking at a VFR chart. And of course, it's been maybe months since uh, he or she has looked at this VFR uh, chart. And so we're going to go back into special use airspace. And we're going to go back into restricted areas, TFRs, MOAs. And the weak area then is going back in what's required for VFR cloud clearances in all the different categories of airspace. And that knowledge just has gone <laughs> because they haven't been participating in that and they haven't been doing it. But it should be a rather quick review to see where they're at and where they need to be. So that's why I brought up six. Let's go to page seven. And we're going to go a little bit faster this time on page seven. That, and I already mentioned it, National Airspace System, right? Charting symbology. And in the Sierra 3, identify the requirements for operating in special use airspace TFR, as I said. All right? So there we go. <clears throat> and then let's move on to page 10. All right? Seven, eight. We've seen this before, but here it comes again, human factors. And the human factors will be scenario-based, and it's uh, area of operation one hotel. And by this time, personal minimums are already identified, and there will be scenario-based, more than likely on the oral for that. Well, we're now going to skip pretty far forward to page 39. And of course, we've already discussed this, pilotage and dead reckoning, it really hasn't changed, all right? Page 39, navigation, area of operation six. And we also have now plus or minus 100 feet and heading plus or minus 10 degrees, so that came down. And we also have Sierra 6 arriving in route checkpoints within three minutes. And we, we discussed how to really get the airplane on course out of, a, out of an uncontrolled airport, how to, out of a D, out of C, out of airspace Bravo, and, and choosing identifiable ground checkpoints outside that area within 15 miles. And then from that point, because you've written down your takeoff time, go ahead and call flight service and activate your flight plan and give them the uh, time you departed. And normally, uh, th this, this scenario ends with um, an emergency procedure. It could be ditching, single engine over water. And the one I've been uh, discussing is that leads you to your survival knowledge and what would you have with you. And now you're carrying passengers, OK? So, uh, next page, 40, nothing different there, navigation systems and radar services, <laughs> right? And page 41, we gave a good discussion about this for um, diverting with the private pilot, but now there's other scenarios that may not just be you, you have to divert because the weather goes below minimums. You can't land VFR. Uh, and we're, we've already got to this stage where your students should be able to have no trouble with diversion planning and arriving at an alternate, the most distant alternate, with the necessary fuel reserves and make a reasonable estimate of heading, ground speed, arrival time, and fuel consumption to the divert airport, which is down there in uh, Charlie S2. So then we got 42, which is oxygen, or which is, uh, let's go to page 42. And we have the lost procedures all over again. Nothing wrong with climb, or climb, confess, conserve, uh, communicate and make sure the under, there's an understanding of in the year 2021 with the type of equipment we have on the airplane, uh, we're going to bring in the uh, single pilot resource management skills and to discuss what's available to you. And we're going to have to have an event where there's a failure of uh, 
obviously GPS or navigation ability of the airplane to actually get the applicant to consider themselves lost. State of Florida, there's an airport every 25 miles. We have our GPS on our phones. We have it on our iPad. We have it in the FMS if, if we're in a 1000. So <laughs> we're going to fail and get into some systems knowledge uh, on that event. The skip forward to a weak area, which is area of operation eight. We're going to page 48 and it's supplemental oxygen. Okay. We're now getting into pressurized aircraft and how to, how to understand depressurization. And let's look at alpha, eight alpha, which we've got on page 48, supplemental oxygen. To determine the applicant exhibits satisfactory knowledge, risk management, and skills for flight at higher altitudes where supplemental oxygen is required and recommended. All right. Now, we're carrying passengers. There's portable oxygen equipment. We're going to get into some scenarios where we're going to look at FARs and we're going to want that knowledge on what's required in high altitude training and endorsements. Seems to be weak because you're, you're, you're not flying in an airplane that's capable of this. We're flying normally in the uh, if it's a multi, we're flying in a twin or we're flying in a single engine aircraft. <laughs> if we go to the next page, we're in B and we discuss pressurization. Well, once again, this is examined on the oral and we're going to get back into, if you look at A, B, and C, we're getting back into physiological factors and operating of pressurization systems if installed, simulator, simulated pressurization malfunctions and briefing passengers. This is all on the shoulders of the flight instructors and it's just all ground-based instruction and pulling that knowledge out of the FARs. So when it comes time to evaluate it, it it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, pretty straightforward because you've never actually really done it in an airplane. <clears throat> and then, like Charlie started off, what I really want to focus on is uh, takeoff landings and go-arounds. We're going to go back to page 32 and look at um, the power off 180 accuracy approach and landing, and we'll talk about short field landings. So pay, there we go, page 32. Determine the applicant exhibits satisfactory knowledge, risk management skills associated with the power off 180 accuracy approach and landing. No different than 44 years ago. It's the same maneuver. You lose an engine, you got to land the airplane. And there's sometimes there's a confusion about when do we go around if we miss judge our energy management. Well, good judgment, safety of flight, we go around if we're not going to make it to the touchdown zone, right? Is the applicant allowed to go around on the flight test and still receive a temporary airman certificate and meet the standard and the power off 180 accuracy and landing? No. But that's the thing that we want to see. We don't want DPE intervention. And every ACS in, in the back, we discuss DPE intervention. DPE intervention, once it happens, then it always uh, results in a notice of disapproval. Not a failure, not an unsat, didn't flunk your check ride. But what happened was you didn't display proficiency in that area of operation that day with your examiner. We talked about this before. If Ryan was my flight instructor, I might have done 10 of them better than him. But today with DPE Bob, I just didn't do it, right? So how do we, why are these such a problem? Well, it's a problem because it's taught all different ways. So we go back to the uh, 8083, we look at a, a, a pilot FAA document and it's a handbook and we get into the commercial maneuvers and we look at um, steep spiral, right? 
Well, back in the day, if we were at um, 6,500 feet and we simulate engine failure, we're going to then accomplish a steep spiral to what's called the key position in the traffic pattern. We're all talking VFR now. And then from that point, we're going to land the airplane in the touchdown zone. Touchdown zone, obviously, is if you look at Sierra 8 on the bottom of that page right there, within 200 feet beyond a specified point, with no side drift, with the airplane longitudinal axis line, and over the runway center line or landing path. Um, so since there's many different ways to teach it, and that's not the purpose of today's discussion, um, we'll look at a couple ways to maintain energy, lose energy, or end up misjudging and having to just go around. Um, if you really look at this and, and you look at stabilized approach criteria, it's in the knowledge section, so let's scroll up to the top. And in the knowledge uh, section, a stabilized approach to include energy management and concepts. Well, there's nothing that's going to make your flight instructor or your examiner more nervous than not having stabilized approach criteria. And examiners have seen this uh, area of operation many, many, many different ways. So if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use 300 feet. If you're below 300 feet, or some may say 400 or 500, and you're still slipping the airplane because you got too much energy and the longitudinal axis is not aligned with the runway and you're not configured and on speed, power set, then you really, for stabilized approach criteria, it really should go around in that case. So. What leads to that? Well, it's all wind and energy management and how to lose energy and how to maintain it. Obviously, we know drag devices lose energy, right? We also know that slipping the airplane will get the airplane from a high energy state back into where you want to be. When I taught this as a flight instructor, I always taught it from the same perspective of a VFR pattern. There's downwind, and we're going to use this board, right? We have runway nine. Now, obviously, we're writing it that way because we're not reading upside down. So anyway, there we go. So we'll say a thousand. AFE to start with, right? Well, guess what? That's the same pattern that any private pilot mastered, right? And we're going to call this the key point, all right? In the Air Force, that's called the perch. It begins the final turn. Well, what seems to be the problem? What seems to be the problem is Ryan goes out with me and I'm, I'm Private pilot Bob with an instrument rating. He's my flight instructor. He's signing me off to get my commercial. And we always did the, we did them 20 times and we always did it with calm winds, right? I mastered it, okay? Then check ride day comes and we have what I would consider the worst wind. That's an overshooting wind, all right? That changes the key point, right? Now, I'm still going to fly this downwind, base, final. We have all different scenarios where the engine failure event happens, okay, let's say the beginning of the second center line stripe, the end of the second center line stripe. It could be anywhere that we decide, but I'm not a proponent of that. I'm a proponent of this always being the beginning of the touchdown zone because that's what we always did as private pilots and we always taught 
we're going to turn base when we're 45 degrees from that point, right? Well, we're going to take these winds. Here's a typical wind, right? It's a 10 knot headwind on the surface, right? And we're going to change them. This would be an undershooting wind, or we could have a tailwind, five knots, let's say, all right? And we're going to continue to change this point and teach L over D max, and we're going to teach drag devices and how to lose energy and judge our glide path just to a visual aim point. And that's what it's all about. And this also happens in different approaches, breaking out of the weather. It also happens in other, other areas when you're flying different type of aircraft and other maneuvers, okay? So what do we see that goes wrong? Ryan and I just did him at Com Wins 20 times. He said, he can do them better than me. I signed him off, right? We didn't have the opportunity or choose a day where we could do an overshooting or change the runway. Pull up, the, pull up the winds at a different airport. Oh, we're going over there, right? And that changes where the key point is or the perch. And it's just demonstrate, evaluate as a flight instructor and say, look, the reason why you never made it to the runway is you got slow and you added flaps, that had too much drag. So go around, right? Uh, what else? You're too high, you overshoot. Um, these points down the runway, it's not the same picture as they're used to. So we turn too early and we fly direct to that point. Has anybody ever done that? Of course. Of course we all have, right? What's the goal? The goal is my engine failed. I want to land the airplane safely. That's the goal. And we have 200 feet. So that's just an overview. And this gets, this gets into lesson planning and... Any questions on, the, on that? That's the biggest event for commercial. Um, we have discussed uh, on there, let's go down to the skills section, right? And look at Sierra 3 and Sierra 4, which is what I touched upon. Plan and follow a flight path to a selected land area considering out altitude, wind, tr terrain, and obstructions. Four, select the most suitable touchdown point based on the wind, the landing service, obstructions, and aircraft limitations, right? And next page, 33. Go arounds. Well, nothing's changed about go arounds, and I think we hit that pretty hard on how important that is and what can go wrong. Uh, let's move to 52, and we got systems and equipment malfunctions, right? And this is in area of operation nine, emergency operations. So this is a big emphasis item, and it's systems of the aircraft, which are, are also tested in the oral and or on the walk around, right? So when we're doing the walk around on the airplane as flight instructors, it's a great time to say or learn what systems knowledge the your student has. And most of them from the walk around standpoint, whether it's uh, antennas or great time to talk about um, overall condition of tires and whatever system you want to pull up when you're discussing brakes or primary flight controls because you got the best visual aid right there in the world. What are the primary flight controls? Ailerons, rudders, elevators. And let's see, let's see how those work. And you know, obviously if it's an in instrument flight test, we're focusing on where's the VOR localizer antenna, where's the GPS antennas, what's this, what's that? And it's always leaks. Um, and I think that the, by the time the commercial pilot is at this level, most of the things that you're doing besides introducing the Shondells, which are great energy management maneuvers and clearing turns, lazy eights, uh, eights on pylons, we're just adding to that knowledge and now we're adding the power off 180 accuracy landing. Short field landing, short field landing, common error. 
um, not understanding that, and this was a change to the ACS a couple years ago, we can go around, okay? So if you received a notice of disapproval for landing short of your point, that's bad judgment, unable to determine energy management, and when all you had to do is power pitch, go around, it's acceptable. Uh, the FAA looked at thousands of notices as disapproval for commercial pilots and said, why are all these disapprovals happening for short field landings? Well, because you weren't allowed to go around before. So that makes sense. You're landing a 2500 strip or you're in a DA-62 going into a grass field and it's a short runway. What would we do? First of all, we want to slow the airplane down. We want to get it to a slower speed on final, fully configured with full flaps. And it should be 1.3 times the VSO to clear a 50 foot obstacle with an aim point that you're gonna to have to shift short or shift long and touch down as a commercial pilot within 100 feet of the touchdown zone. Unlike private pilot where it was 200 feet, right? Still has to be stabilized approach criteria should be at a slower speed than normal. Whatever 1.3 times the VSO is or the POH recommends for the short field landing. The aim point is gonna be short of the touchdown zone. Of course, we're gonna train and evaluate to clear a 50 foot obstacle. And of course we can go around if we're not stable, if we don't have the proper aim point. It's a short field landing. We can come back, set it all back up again. Wind changes, someone's on the runway. For whatever reason, we don't have the checklist com completed. We can go around out of that. With that, I'm gonna end by reading some other uh, items pertaining to the last two sessions we had by four other examiners that have compiled these. And I've left a copy with um, the flight school. And so flight instructor emphasis in areas of operation. And we're gonna start with private, okay? Um, on the ground portion, we discussed when we were in that session, minimum equipment list knowledge and weight shift computations is a problem. Well, that's because you're gonna have your private pilot redo a weight and balance, right? In the flight portion, unusual attitude recovers, recoveries. We did a good discussion on that in the instrument section. And what's the, what's the area that's failing? Uh, this private pilot now, you say recover and they look outside, so. They don't start by identifying what attitude they're in, speed up their cross check, reference to instruments, and make the proper power, pitch, unload the airplane, adjustments, right? Now, um, instrument rating. I've got VR signal phase differences, and we're not gonna get into the attitude indicator, but a lot, a lot of confusion in the instrument rating about attitude indicators and how they actually work for the systems portion. Flight portion of an instrument, how to use RMI and actually loading an IFR flight plan in the FMS when equipped, and we had a, we had a question on that, <clears throat> right? Why is that a problem for the instrument phase? Because the flight instructor loads all that for the student. Just direct it and have them load it. Do it in a simulator, do it in a trainer so, they, so the student can do it. Don't do that for them. Um, commercial, as we just finished up, the ground portion, basic aerodynamics, all right? Uh, and then the flight portion, we talked about uh, eights on pylons, selecting the pylon selection which is going to come right from how the flight instructor sets the tone and initially teaches an eights on pylon maneuver. Uh, power off 180 
uh, not being a little high and slipping down to target or just forcing aircraft on the ground. Well, we talked about that because we referred to the ACS when it came to stabilized approach criteria. Um, we're going to go to another one, and it's um, back way back in the beginning today where we talked about IACRA. IACRA not being complete two days prior. Endorsements missing in logbooks. No real reason for it if you have another flight instructor check it or you're using the advisory circular or you're using your own logbook as I had to do back in college 44 years ago because I had all the proper endorsements. So by the time I became a flight instructor, I'm like, okay, I'm signing this guy off to go solo. I'm signing this guy or girl off to go take an instrument check. Well, this is a retest. Well, now we know it's 6149 today and we refer to the different FERs. Um, hood time log while on cross countries. We call that in the examiner world double dipping. We can't do that. Okay, and that's mainly the private pilot phase. Engine systems weakness. Uh, so when you get into systems, don't forget to look at the POH from the very basics and get the knowledge out of your students before you sign them off if they understand the pedostatic system, if they understand how the power plant works, if they understand the electrical system, because they're going to go through some of those. And this is a big one mainly for twins, different altitudes, density, altitude, absolute, etc. cetera, uh, emergency descents for private. We already discussed log books. Um, Never file on a flight plan, power off 180, no flap landing checklist. We didn't really talk a lot about checklists, but as we progress our students from private to instrument to commercial, more and more familiarization with checklist and checklist errors. I still do it today. If we skip a checklist or we do it from memory, it could have a bad outcome, right? Out and available, not challenge in response, but whatever phase of flight your student's in, don't run it for them. Have them run the checklist when they're ready, depending on their situational awareness. Uh, I talked about pressurization. There's another examiner saying pressurization and high altitude questions for commercial. Uh, that's about it. And with, with that, the commercial ACS today that we reviewed, we really talked about a lot of this when we got to the privates. It's just a review of these basic maneuvers. Do we have any questions? All right, thanks.